All right, guys, welcome back to Strong Successful Mail. So for today, I'm going to give over an article that's probably one of the best articles I've read with regards to a situation where a woman, she's in her 40s, and she's complaining because she's alone, has no husband, uh, she's unhappy, and she has no children. And this article, she really gets into the whole mindset that she had behind all this, and it starts off when she met this great guy in her when she was young, married the dude, and everything was cool for a while because the guy was great to her, loved her, treated her well. And then she started making more money. She started really rising in her career. And all of a sudden, this guy who was great to her, all of a sudden, he wasn't so attractive. All of a sudden, he wasn't making enough money for her. His job, his blue-collar job, wasn't good for her anymore. The kind of car he drove wasn't good for her anymore. Because, again, as I've said before, status is everything with women. They always want a guy they can look up to, not look down to. And eventually, she ditches the guy, even though he was great to her and loved her. She ditches the guy thinking that she can do better. Because it was her, she was in her 20s, it was her prime. And this is a situation that happens all the time now. Because you have these women, they spend their prime, their prime years in their 20s. You know, they're either doing their, they're working hard towards their career and, and ignoring that's the, t- that's the prime time for them, which they could obviously find guys and husbands and so forth. Because the biological clock will come into play almost every time. And also, as guys say, they're riding the carousel in their 20s. They get to their 30s or in their 40s. Biological clocks go crazy, but no guys want them. And then they complain and whine and cry that they're alone and everything's so horrible and blah, 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 blah. But this article really gets into it. And here's the thing, guys. This article is actually seven years old. I found this a few days ago. And even though it's old, it's great. It really goes into it. So that's why I chose it. It's a little long. But you'll see that it's worth it to really get an idea what's going on in their crazy heads. So, the title of the article is, I left the love of my life because I thought I could do better. Now I'm childless and alone at 42. This happens all the time. Starts off saying, Laughing and dancing with my fiancé at our engagement party, I thought I might actually burst with happiness. Surrounded by our family and friends, I looked at Matthew and felt certain I had met the man I was going to spend the rest of my life with. That's what a lot of women think in the beginning. They get all caught up in the emotions of the wedding because pretty much all women at least once want to be the bride and be the center of attention and go through that. And then that's that. Quite simply, he was my soulmate. We were desperately in love and had our future life together mapped out. First, we would save to buy our own house Then we would come a romantic wedding ceremony and children would follow. It all seemed so simple to my naive 19-year-old self. I was, I smugly told myself, the girl who had it all. So why, 20 years later, do I find myself single, childless, and tormented by the fact that I have thrown everything away, the only true chance of happiness I ever had? That's in her mind. Everybody has an opportunity to better themselves and make their lives better, but... Oh, well, eight years after the wonderful engagement party in 1989, I told you this is a while, I walked away from my dear, devoted, loyal Matthew, convinced that somewhere out there, a better, more exciting, more fulfilling life awaited me, only there wasn't. Notice the word exciting. Now I am 42, and I have all the trappings of success, a high-flying career, financial security, and a home in the heart of London's trendy Notting Hill. I'm sure that's expensive. But I don't have the one thing I crave more than anything. Can you guess? A loving husband and family. She had the chance. My father warned me not to throw this love away, but I was sure I'd find Mr. Perfect around the corner. They all do. How many guys have been in this situation? You've been dumped by a girl that you've treated great, treated like gold, thinks that... uh, she can find, replace you in a heartbeat, and now she's older and alone and lonely and complaining and whining and, you know, complaining that guys don't want to settle down and don't want to get involved and settle with a 30 or 40 year old. Happens all the time. It's called karma. Tough shit. She goes on to say, you see, I never did find another man who offered everything Matthew did, who understood me and loved me like he did. Someone who was my best friend as well as my lover. 
Today, seeing friends with their children around them tortures me. As I know, I am unlikely to ever have a family of my own. I think about the times Matthew and I talked about having children, even discussing the names we would choose. I cannot believe I turned my back on so much happiness. Instead, here I am back on the singles market, looking for the very thing I discarded with barely a backward glance all those years ago. Happens all the time. I know I can't have Matthew back, and it hurts when I hear snippets of information about his life and how content he is. Fifteen years after I ended our relationship, he is happily married. Well, good for Matthew for moving the hell on. You're going to see in this article that she does all these things to sabotage him moving on. I mean, she, this is a really selfish woman here. It's, it's unbelievable. At this time of year, so many people will be assessing their lives and relationships, wondering if the the grass is greener on the other side. Many will make the mistake of contentment for boredom, forgetting to cherish the good things they have. I would urge those who are considering walking away from such riches to think again. How different things would be for me now if I'd only listened to Matthew when he pleaded with me not to leave him in 1987. Tears pouring down his face. I was crying too, and it tortured me to watch the heart of the man I loved breaking in front of me, but I was resolute. Well, if a woman's breaking up with you, the last thing you want to do is cry like a baby in front of her. You pretty much take it like a man and walk away. And the whole waterworks thing is going to be very attractive. But many people have made that mistake, so nobody's perfect. One day I might look back and realize I made the biggest mistake in my life. I told him as we clung to each other desperately how prophetic those words have proven to be. And he says... I will always be here for you, Matthew promised, and I arrogantly thought that somehow I could put him on ice and return to him. So she's going to ditch this guy, try to find something better, but in her mind, it doesn't work out. I can always have this guy on layaway. Wrong. And this whole him saying, I will always be there for you, again, that's the worst thing you can do. The best thing you can do, girl dumps you out of nowhere or wants to divorce you, you walk away, never look back, and you sure as hell don't do this, I'll always be there for you. You're gone, out of her life. Cut off all contact. Matthew and I, this is her whole story, and I'm going to read all this just so you can see where it's coming from. At some points, she does ramble on, but we know how women work. Matthew and I met when we attended the same comprehensive school in Essex. She's from England. We started dating just before Christmas in 1987. When I was 17 and studying from A-levels. By that time, he had left school and was working as a motorcycle courier. We got on like a house on fire, and our families each supported the relationship. Before long, we had fallen in love. Matthew was romantic, but incredibly practical, something that would later come to annoy me. (laughs) Men are logical and full of ration. Women are emotional. That's how we are. His gifts to me that Christmas were a leather jacket and a pair of thermal leggings. Two weeks later, when we'd been seeing each other for less than a month, he proposed. Dumbass. We were in my little mini clubman when he shouted at at me to stop the car. Scared something was wrong, I braked in the middle of traffic and we both jumped out. Then, oblivious to the other drivers beeping their horns, he got out down on one knee in the middle of the road. I love you, Karen Cross, he said. Promise you'll marry me one day. This is like some crappy scene in a movie. I laughed and said yes, thrilled that he felt the same way that I did. In the summer of 1989, while out for a romantic meal, Matthew <clears throat> proposed properly with a diamond solitaire ring. Properly, make sure he has that expensive ring. Two months later, we held our engagement party for 40 friends and family at the little house we were renting at the time. This is where it starts to get good. The following year, we bought a tiny starter home in Gray's, Essex, which we moved into with furniture we had begged, borrowed, and stolen. We giggled with delight at the thought of this grown-up new life. It was my first junior role at a woman's magazine, and Matthew worked fitting tires and exhaust, so our combined salaries of around 15,000 pounds a year meant we struggled to make the mortgage payments. But we didn't care, telling ourselves that it wouldn't be long before we were earning more and able to afford weekly treats in a bigger home where we could bring up the babies we had planned. But then the housing market crashed, and we were plunged in negative equity. Struggling should have brought us closer together, 
and at first it did. But as time went on and my magazine career and salary advanced, I started to resent Matthew as he drifted from one dead-end job to another. So here we go. Her career's taken off. She's making more money. She's now rising higher than him. Meanwhile, he's staying the same. And her attraction for him is dropping. I said this before, and I'll say it again to the, my dying breath. When it comes to women, the guys they're going to have the true respect for and admiration are guys that are always higher than them. At the very least, the same level in terms of sal salary and so forth. But you want the real respect, you always have to be higher than them. That's just how it is. It's stupid, but that's how women operate. I still loved him, but I began to feel embarrassed by his blue-collar jobs. Annoyed that, despite his intelligence, he didn't have a career. Then he bought a lurid blue and pink VW Beetle. Why couldn't he drive a normal car? Things that now seem incredibly insignificant began to niggle. So again, this guy treats her like gold, loves her, everything a woman could want. And he was good enough for her before, but now her career's taken off. Now all of a sudden, that doesn't matter. How many times does this happen? I began to wish he was more sophisticated and earned more. Higher status. I felt envious of friends with better off partners who were able to support them as they started their families. So in other words, this guy doesn't make as much money, and so if she wants to go off and have babies and take some time off, he can't afford to pay the bills. A lot of women are incredibly resentful of their husbands. They're in this situation where the woman is the breadwinner, and the guy doesn't make as much as her, and she has to then work after her maternity leave and things like that. I've known a lot of buddies of mine and people I've known where you could tell their wives are resentful of this. Because I got friends that their wives make more than them. Or at least they're on the same level. And she couldn't take as much time off. Pissed her the hell off. I stopped seeing Matthew as my equal. I stopped seeing all the qualities that made him me fall in love with him. His fierce intelligence. Our shared sense of humor. His determination not to follow the crowd. Instead, I saw someone who was holding me back. I hate the fact Matthew was suddenly putting another woman before me. Oh, I jumped ahead. I encouraged him to find a career and was thrilled when he was accepted to join the police in 1995. I should have heralded a new chapter in our lives, but it only hastened the end. We went from spending every evening and weekend together to hardly seeing one another. Matthew was doing round-the-cloth shifts while I worked long hours on the launch of the new magazine. So he finally got something, and she was happy about that. He's busting his butt, doing what he has to do for a while, and still she's not happy. Yeah, she couldn't see him as much, but at least he's rising at least up a little bit. Something respectable. He's a cop. Doesn't matter. Our sex lives had dwindled, and nights out were rare. I stopped appreciating little things he did, like leaving romantic notes in the pillow or scouring secondhand bookshops for novels that he knew I loved. He was my best friend, yet I took him totally for granted. After festering for weeks about his shortcomings, I told Matthew I was leaving. We spent hours talking and crying as he tried to convince me to stay, but I was adamant. My parents were horrified that I was walking away from a man that felt they felt was right for me. My father's words to me that day could continue to haunt me. Karen, think carefully about what you're doing. <clears throat> There's a lot to be said for someone who truly loves you. Yeah, but I refused to listen, convinced there'd be another, better Mr. Wright waiting around the corner. So she's in her 20s, she's in her prime, and in the article, which I'm going to connect to this uh, video, you're going to see pictures of her at 42 years old, and then you're going to see pictures of her when she's younger. And when she was younger, she's pretty. At 42, no. So, obviously in her prime, in her 20s, she feels, hey... I'm, my career's taken off. I'm making good money. I'm hot. I can get any guy I want. No problem. And I kick this guy to the curb and it doesn't work out. He's telling me I'll, he'll be there for me forever, blah, blah, blah. I can get him anytime I want. And that's the attitude a lot of women have. And it comes back to bite him in the ass later on. And you'll see it here. It's going to come back to bite her in the ass in a major way. I moved into a rented flat a few miles away from Hornchurch, Essex, and embraced single life with a vengeance. By now, I was an editor on a national magazine. Life was one long round of premieres and dinner or drink parties. Code, 
riding the carousel. Matthew and I remained close. That was dumb of him. Even telling each other about new relationships. But though I dumped him, I never felt the women he met were good enough. I can see now I was acting out of jealousy. You think? I clearly wanted to keep him for myself. Selfish, selfish. But still, she wasn't going back to him. He wasn't good enough for her. Even as a cop. Our closeness was, however, called to a halt in 2000 when he met his first serious girlfriend after me, Sarah. Now you're going to see where she starts sabotaging things. This guy, he's a good guy, you can tell, is trying to move on. And this woman is so selfish, she keeps sabotaging it. This stuff happens. One night, shortly after his 34th birthday, I phoned to ask his advice about something. She didn't need his advice about something. She just wanted to constantly stay in contact, keep make that he can't quite get over her. That's what's going on here. Matthew was unusually abrupt and asked me not to call him again. Good for Matthew. Please don't send me birthday or Christmas cards anymore, either. Sarah opened your card last week and was really upset. I have to put her feelings first. Well, Matthew's starting to get a pair. I hated the fact that Matthew was suddenly putting another woman before me. How dare she come between us? The nerve of this woman. She kicks this guy to the curb. He treats her like gold, loves her. He's trying to improve himself, but he's still not good enough for her. He's moving on, and she's constantly trying to sabotage it, and now she's mad that he's putting his new woman ahead of the woman that kicked his ass to the curb. Unbelievably selfish. It gets it continues on. Over the next few weeks, I'm ashamed to say, I vented my spleen at both of them in a series of heated phone calls. This dude should have freaking uh, put a restraining order on her. I was completely irrational. I didn't want Matthew back, but felt un- upstaged by Sarah. Unsurprisingly, after one particularly nasty argument, Matthew put the phone down and refused to take any more of my calls. Good job, Matthew. I didn't realize it at the time, but I would never speak to him again. Aw, poor you. Shortly afterwards, I met Richard. It was a whirlwind romance. And within a year, we were engaged in buying an idyllic farmhouse in Norfolk, countryside, where I continued my journalistic career, commuting to London. He was a successful singer, and we toured the country. Successful. And he's a a rock star. I thought I finally found the excitement and love that I craved. Excitement. But Matthew was never far from my thoughts. And Richard complained that I often brought him into conversations, even comparing them. So now she moves on to the new guy, but she's got to keep the drama alive by constantly bringing up the other guy. You see how selfish this woman is? Drama, drama, drama. They all love drama. That's, all. That's the name of the game. They were so different. Although outwardly romantic, Richard was repeatedly unfaithful. I don't blame Richard. And I never felt secure enough to start a family with him. Eventually, after three and a half years together, he walked out. Having admitted his latest paramour was pregnant by him. My life fell apart. Over the next year, I struggled to pull myself back together and did a lot of soul searching. I finally understood what my father had meant. I realized Matthew was the only person who had ever loved and understood me. Well, too late. When I heard that through a mutual friend that he had split up with Sarah, I wrote him, apologizing and asking for forgiveness and a second chance. That guy would be out of his goddamn mind if he got back with this woman. But you're going to see it's not going to happen. But if this was a TV, a Hallmark movie, they would have it that he gets back with a girl, even though she treated him like crap. But in real life, that doesn't happen. It was six years since we had last spoken, but naively I thought he would want to hear from me. What I did not know was that Sarah was still living at the house, and it was she who opened my very personal letter. It included my phone number, and she left me several angry, hurtful voicemails. I don't blame her. Yet again, I had inadvertently caused problems in Matthew's life. Inadvertently, she knew what she was doing. So it was unsurprising I never heard from him. Despite writing several times over the next few months, in the end, I left it at birthday and Christmas cards, thinking he'd find a way to get in touch if he ever changed his mind. When guys start ghosting women... They become relentless. They will keep after you and after you and after you and after you until they can, because it drives them crazy being ghosted. And so obviously since she was hot when she was younger, she's not used to all of a sudden guys not wanting to have anything to do with her. But 
she this guy dodged a bullet. She did him a favor by kicking his ass to the curb earlier in life. Because can you imagine being married to this woman? I mean, continuously, all the drama. Oh, my God. I'm hoping for this dude that he got something a lot better. Then I heard a couple of years ago, Matthew had married his new partner, Nicola. For a few moments, I couldn't breathe. Then the tears came. Yes, I'm feeling the waterworks right now for her. Matthew and Nicola still live in Essex, and as far as I know, don't have yet have children. That's the next milestone I truly dread. This lady's got to move the hell on. It's been 11 years since Matthew and I last spoke, and I have to accept the door has closed. Perhaps he has found what he's looking for, and I am a distant memory. I don't think he's going to forget this crazy chick to the day he dies. She definitely left that much of an imprint on him. I've had one other significant relationship since Richard, with Rob. But that recently ended for four, after four years. Rob reminded me a lot of Matthew. He was decent and honorable, the life and soul of the party, but with a kind and sensitive side. But we were each too jaded by previous heartache to make it work. And while I wanted children, he had a grown-up son and didn't want to start over again. So once again, I am on my own, my mind full of if-onlys, if only I stayed with Matthew. We'd almost certainly be married with children. Or maybe Matthew wasn't the right man. I will never know the answer, but my decision to leave him was def definitely cost me the chance of ever becoming a mother. This chick is crazy. She should not be a mother. Now I can only look back and admonish my selfish, younger self. When I visit friends and family back in our hometown, I can't help but hope I bump into Matthew. I like to think I'd say I'm sorry, that I will always be there for him, but I wouldn't be surprised if he turned his back on me and kept walking. If I was Matthew and saw her, I would run like my ass was on fire. This woman is trouble. And here we go. Here, here's the message she wants to give to women. To those, of, to those out there that are thinking of walking away from humdrum relationships, I would say don't mistake contentment for unhappiness, as I did. It could be a choice you'll regret the rest of your life. So, are we supposed to feel bad for her? I don't, because I've known women like this my whole life. I've heard these stories and so forth. You know, many of us were guys in the 20s, dated great girls, but they kicked us to the curb because we weren't enough. Now they're in their 30s and 40s and complaining and whining and crying that they're all alone and so forth. And this woman's situation was long before social media, dating apps, instant communication. Now it's much, much worse now because of all these things that women have all this validation and attention. And so what we're going to continue to see, guys, and this is going to go on for a while, is more and more women, you're going to hear constantly hear stories like this. And for the, us guys that have been burned in life and are going our own way, it puts a big smile on our face, you know, but it's karma. And it may come eventually, may take a generation that all of a sudden you start seeing a reversal. Where women will start getting an attitude adjustment and in their 20s start settling down like they once did. But we shall see. But anyhow, it's a long story, but I thought it was a really good one to go over just seeing what goes on. It's a perfect example of what goes on in a woman's head over situations like this, the ration behind it, the reasoning. So, all right, guys, that is it for today. Be sure to comment down below. Let me know what you think. And also be sure to like the video, share with your friends, and subscribe. And I will talk to you next time.